Welcome to the No Name Brand Podcast. My name is Sashka Hanarapal, actress, singer, dancer, turned brand marketing sales and advertising strategist who brands your soul. And each week I bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover your undergod. Turn up your leadership notches, challenge the status quo, because you're fast and furious with a powerful message to share with the world. Thank you for taking time out with me today. And without further ado, let's get our creative and wisdom juices below. On today's show, we have a writer, teacher, and self-proclaimed word nerd who wants to challenge the status quo of higher education. Yay! So a few years ago, she went back to school to get her MFA degree. That's a Master of Fine Arts in Writing. Little did she know that she was about to stumble upon an idea that would change her entire outlook on writing and on life. As a graduate student, she got to see the academic world up close and personal, and she was surprised that many of what she had learned in school, she couldn't have taught herself. More importantly, she began to feel like grad school was about one thing only letting a select few people into the ivory tower while weeding everyone else. Want to write something that doesn't fit the program? Nope, sorry. Want to adapt the curriculum to fit your work or family life? Too bad. Can't afford the tuition? Yep, you guessed it. Sorry. She began to think there had to be a better way. And that's when it hit her. Boom. Why not do it yourself? And with that, the DIY Master of Fine Arts online was born. Please help me today in welcoming our next guest, the bold and bodacious, Gabriela Pereira. Thank Hello. you so much for having me. That's probably the best intro I've ever gotten. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Awesome. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the No Name Brand Podcast. How are you today? I'm great. I'm even better now that I'm on the show. This is so fun. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on to the show. I want to dive into my first question because when I was going through and reading about going through on the website and reading about you and finding out information, I was like, damn, I mean, there are quite a few people are like, you can actually do that. You can start your own curriculum and education center. And oh, wow, that's pretty. So how did you do it? Like, is your program recognized? What red tape did you have to go through that it also gets recognized? Tell us about it. So I like to say that I didn't found DIY MFA. DIY MFA found me. Love it kind it. of all happened by accident in the beginning. <laughs> I mean, I had full intentions of becoming a writer and writing fiction. I was in a program uh, that specialized in writing for children. I had a children's book manuscript that I was shopping around at the time. I also had a few others like in the bottom drawer of my desk and they will stay there forever, <laughs> like most writers. So I really didn't expect DIY MFA to become a thing. Now, I will preface this by saying that it is not an accredited program in the United States. You do not get a diploma. In fact, it's part of our brand that you don't get a diploma because then we'd just be like every other program out there that gives you a sparkly piece of paper in exchange for money and a couple of years spent in school. So the idea behind DIY MFA was to demystify what exactly happens in a traditional Master of Fine Arts program. And the real impetus behind it is the simple reality that unlike, say, a medical degree or a legal degree, where you kind of need the piece of paper in order to do your job. I mean, I don't know about you, but if someone's cutting my heart open to do open heart surgery, they darn well better have a medical degree <laughs> hanging on their wall. Like I'm not about to sign up for surgery with like a DIY and medical student. Same thing if I'm like on trial for my life, I'm not about to just hire someone who says, oh yeah, I know law, I'll represent you. So, but with writing and with most of the arts, you don't really need the credential. I mean, in some ways doing the art is already the credential. And the thing that really hit that home for me was that in my own MFA program, not a single one of my professors, I mean, I'm sure there were other professors in the program that did have higher degrees, like beyond college that had MFAs or PhDs, but my personal professors, the people I took classes with, 
not a single one of them had an MFA or a PhD. So to me, that struck me as being really telling about what the publishing industry and what the arts are all about, that at the end of the day, it's not about the diploma hanging on your wall. It's about how good your art is. And if you're really good at the art, you get to teach it. And there are all these other issues that I have with that whole philosophy. I mean, I don't necessarily think that people who are good at making art or good at writing are necessarily the best qualified people to teach it. I think there's a very big difference between people who are good teachers and people who are good writers or good artists or whatnot. There are very few rare birds who do both very well, but they are not the norm. But that's a whole other conversation. I think the main issue really was this idea that you needed the diploma as almost like a gatekeeper, Mm -hmm. keeping you from doing the art. And that's completely not true. It's not like medicine. It's not like law. You can do the creative work without the diploma hanging on your wall. Well, that's pretty similar to marketing and advertising. If you're an art director or a creative director, you cannot study to be a creative director. You have to have life experience. So you'd be studying learning about philosophy and art and psychology and all these different things. But it's in today's world online, everybody's a marketer and they haven't even studied for it. And there is a double-edged sword to that. And I think that's sort of what I hoped DIY MFA could serve, like the gap that I hoped it could serve to fill, which is that there are certain things you can be doing. If you want to be a writer, if you want to be a creative person of some sort, but particularly in the writing field, there are certain things you can proactively be doing in your life to improve those skills. And I think a lot of marketers and a lot of people in the creative space Some of them know how to do that and they go out and they find those resources on their own and they might even do it relatively naturally. They might not even realize that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. But the same thing is true in writing. And so the, the whole goal with DIY MFA and when I had that idea originally was to sort of systematically put together a curriculum so that people could, who are self starters, could just sort of do it on their own, but have a roadmap, some sort of system guideline. Mm -hmm. so that they're not just shooting in the dark and trying 800 million things and then falling on their face. Yeah. How does it work with uh, DIY MFA? Do you register online and then you do it over a certain period of time? Do you get some kind of, you've done it, (laughs) sparkly, I don't know, diploma or something? So with DIY MFA, so we do have like our flagship courses. And at the moment we have two flagship courses, one of which is in the process of being rebuilt and will be reopening all brand sparkly new in Woo-hoo! the fall. And so those are sort of the two main like fundamental places where you can get kind of the structured instruction. But then there's a lot of other just resources on the website. Like anyone who teaches marketing or who teaches any sort of online info product kind of thing There's often a lot of stuff available online on their website, but then it's sort of for the systematic nuts and bolts in depth and also for like the ease of reference, right? Like with the DIY MFA courses, yes, you could probably scramble around online and eventually piece together something that resembles what these classes look like, but it's a whole lot easier to just go through it the systematic way because then it's all figured out for you. But with the two courses, it's very community driven. And that was something that I wanted to do from the very beginning is that our students don't necessarily graduate. In fact, we encourage them to stick around and stay (laughs) part of the community. In fact, we encourage people to retake the class as many times as they wish with the students who are taking it new. Our communities online, like our Facebook groups, are very engaged on purpose. And in fact, in previous years, I actually would have class ambassadors, people who are alumni of the program from times past, who then kind of stay on and help shepherd the new students. Because I think that community aspect is so important. And I think that's the danger when you're creating an online curriculum is that it's very hard to build that community and that feeling of camaraderie when people are dealing with each other through a computer screen. Yeah. Now, just sitting here talking about all of this, the first thing that came to my mind was, oh my God, Gabriella is so confident. Like she just knows what she's talking about. And those that are listening we always tend to do this. Like it sounds so amazing, but we forget about all that work that was done before and where you start. Where did you start? What did you start with and how has it progressed? I made so many mistakes. There are so many serious flaws that have happened in the past (laughs) and that we have fixed. In fact, if you like in the DIY MFA book, which came out last year, the first chapter is on the concept of iteration. 
which is really the, it's from the startup world, like the tech startup world, where you create a beta version of your product. In this case, the product is the curriculum. And then you test it and then you fix it and then you test it. And there were about like between when I came up with the DIY MFA idea, like that first little light bulb moment, that was in 2010. Between that and when I launched my first online course, like official course, that was in 2014. Wow. I did not write the first, the book until 2015. So like there was a lot of like, iteration and false starts and like, let's try this. Oh, I'm not sure if that's really the direction I want to go in. Backtrack, try this other thing. A lot of stuff. And for people who really want to see where DIY MFA started, we still have like dig back into our archives. Like look at those articles that were on the website at the very beginning of the course. And we have been giving some of those a facelift, but I do purposefully keep some things there that are a little rough around the edges because I think it's important for people to know where brands have started from, that it hasn't always been sparkly and beautiful on the outside. In fact, in one of my courses, the course where we talk about building your author brand, I look, I do a walk down memory lane and flag every single one of those really bad mistakes that I made, because it's not just a way of like pointing and saying, hey, look how funny I am. Ha ha, I made mistakes. It's also about being realistic, right? Because Mm -hmm. people see the finished product, especially in the writing sphere, where like, You go to a bookstore, you pull a book off the shelf, and it's very easy to think that that Stephen King novel was exactly that perfect the minute he wrote it. And it's really not true. And if you look back at like well-known authors' work product over the years, after a while, people get better. Like most authors tend to improve with time because they've been doing it over and over and their process gets better. So I think it's important to no author in their right mind would let people read the rough draft version of their book. I would never let someone read the rough draft version of my books, but this is sort of the next best thing, right? Like being able to sort of pull back the curtain a little bit and let people see that things were not always glamorous and perfect, that there are ways to also regroup and redirect and sort of refocus your attention. And it's not going to destroy you as a, an entrepreneur or as a writer or as a creative person to shift your focus a little bit. You mentioned something just beforehand. By the time the listeners hear this, my book will be online and it's a nonfiction book and I'm really excited about it. And I never, ever thought I'd write a book, never in my entire life, because I was told I'd rather stick to acting and drama and singing and dancing than write something. And I really found it was really hard. It was hard writing the book, especially the system that I have and putting it into facts and Mm -hmm. to give it to someone else to follow. But then I've written my second book and that's a fiction book and I loved it. And something that you mentioned was community that you have, because that's, I noted that over here, that's the thing for DIY MFA is that you have the write plus read plus community equals the masters of fine art. That's the purpose or the philosophy behind it. And I would love that, just that community of writers to give me constructive criticism or feedback about the articles. It's it's pretty cool. Like, how do you manage that? Like, how does that, is that on the paid version or is that on? So I personally am not a fan of trying to manage other people's communities because I don't think that I will do it justice, right? And I think that when you try to create sort of an artificial community, then all of a sudden it falls flat, right? And I've seen it happen where people try to control the way, like I wouldn't go near trying to run critique groups with a 10 foot pole because I feel like that wouldn't be, either I'd have to be an active participant in every single group I managed, which would be a nightmare because there are not that many hours in the day, or it would just, it would be artificial, right? It would be kind of like a hierarchy where like one person at the top is dictating how all the groups should run themselves. And that's ridiculous. That's not the DIY that they weigh. So what I believe in is giving people a space where they can connect. And we have multiple levels, like all of our groups, all of our paid programs have Facebook groups attached to them. We're actually secretly working on expanding that into like a full on community kind of thing down the road, like with forums and other ways of engaging with each other. But that's a little bit in the future. But then we also have just a general Facebook group where anyone who subscribes to our newsletter can join. And that group is really about just letting people sort of cross pollinate and connect with each other. And kind of like the She Podcast group where you and I connected, where people just sort of get a chance to meet other fellow word nerds, as it were. 
And then it's really about like, I found as like a community leader, it's about modeling behavior of like how one connects with other people in my own way, but then also encouraging people to then take that extra step and do it on their own. So it's sort of that combination of letting people know, like, actually, you are allowed to ask, hey, does anyone want to read my sci-fi novel and I'll read yours if you read mine kind of thing. That's totally fair game in our Facebook group. That's what it's there for. But at the same time, also modeling that behavior. A few years ago, I had a project that I needed a couple of people, a couple of extra eyes on. So I put out a call myself and said, hey, word nerds, anyone want to see behind the scenes on a DIY MFA project and you'll get to give me some feedback and see how it works. And I got a whole bunch of takers. It's sort of that combination as I see it as like sort of leading by example and showing people how to use the community, both by how I use it, but then also encouraging them to sort of take it in their own direction as well. And the other piece of it too is like letting people know like, okay, you can find each other here, but once you've kind of connected with that group, like now it's time for you to sort of like, now you run with it and you do what you want to do. And we I'll often share ideas. Like I tell people how I have a writing buddy who lives in another state in the United States. And we do like, we will sit in coffee shops, but be in separate states in like Skype and be like talking to each other over Skype and writing at the same time. And we're like writing buddies, even though we're, we don't live anywhere near each other. So I think once people start to see what you can do with the internet in terms of community, all of a sudden the light bulbs go off. And that's when I step back and say, all right, guys, run with it. Do what you want. I'm just here to sort of give those little sparks of ideas. Oh, I love that. I really, I think it's a brilliant idea. Absolutely brilliant. Great. And I will add, because I'm assuming that your listeners are also probably on the entrepreneurial space, that this is all woven into both the marketing in our, like in the way we, the messaging for our business. And also it's woven very sort of subtly into just the way we create our products, right? So like the fact that we don't give a diploma, we actually answer that in the marketing message. It's, and part of it is a logistical thing. Like I just do not want to go through the pains of getting accredited in the United States because that is a logistical nightmare. But then it's also part of the marketing message that you don't need a, a diploma in order to be a writer. And so it becomes, it's like you can take this, a logistical problem and actually make it part of your branding and solve the problem. Yeah. Which a lot of my entrepreneurs need. Yeah. To solve mm -hmm. that. Problem. Yeah. What I wanted to ask, I mean, I read you, a great tip that you've got for writing books is that in order to write, you need to read. What kind of books should you be reading or should we be reading when writing? Do you have any guidelines? I do. <laughs> I have lots of guidelines. So I have what I call the ABCs of the writer's library. And I believe that every writer should have three books on their shelf. And you can remember what they are by, based on the ABCs. So the first book, the A, is an anthology of a short form work in your genre. So if you're writing novels, you want a, an anthology of short stories. If you're writing poetry, you want an anthology of poems. If you're writing memoir, you want anthology of essays. The idea behind having an anthology is that by reading short form literature, you're able to, in one literary gulp, get your head around both the macro level of the piece and the micro level. It's very difficult to look at a novel and hold all the micro sentence level niceties of that novel in your head and then also simultaneously be thinking about all of the broad considerations like your characters and the plot structure and things like that. In a short story, that's extremely doable because you can see the whole thing both the bird's eye view and the like laser focused view in one view, right? So the anthology I think is super important. And for readers in fiction, I still, I have yet to find the perfect anthology of fiction. I may just have to edit one at some <laughs> point in my lifetime because I have not yet found one that meets all of my own criteria. <laughs> However, at the moment, the next best thing is a, an anthology called The Art of the Short Story, and it's edited by Dana Gioia and R.S. Gwynn. It's really good. It's got most of the classic stories from like 19th century, 20th century. But then it also has, with every story, it pairs the story with either an essay written by the author or an interview with the author or a news article about the author, something that puts the story into context from the writer's point of view. So that I think is very valuable because it allows you to both look at the work itself as a creative work, but then also see the creative process that went into that work. 
So that's sort of my anthology recommendation. The B is the book of prompts or exercises. And the reason for that is that I firmly believe that when you're writing, if you try to fix the problem in the active work, you could break your book. And I don't believe in wasting time and I don't believe in breaking books. (laughs) So my way of solving issues, like let's say I'm struggling to write realistic dialogue between two characters. For whatever reason, usually dialogue's my forte. Right now I'm struggling or what have you. So what do I do? I take those two characters out of the story and I put them in a scenario that is completely unrelated from the book. And then I attack dialogue from a million different angles with those characters. And the reason I do it outside of the book is that then I can learn the technique without actually destroying whatever it is I'm trying to create in the active book right on the other side, right? So the reason for the writing prompts is that it sometimes when you're trying to exercise that part of your brain, you don't know what to write and then it feels artificial. So my go-to is to have a few writing you know, exercise books and I open it to a random page and I say, all right, let's just do this exercise. An alternative on the DIY MFA site, we have the Writer Igniter and it's, you can also go to writerigniter.com. It's sort of like a slot machine for writers. That's that, another man. way to kind cool. of... Yeah. And the purpose behind it really is just to give people yet another way to just not have to think too hard about the idea so they can focus on the exercise. Because the last thing you want is when you need to just do an exercise. I mean, it's kind of like in musical terms, like practicing your scales. If you have to think too hard about what the notes in the scale are, then that's a waste of time. So we just sort of solve that problem for you. And then you can focus on what really matters, which is practicing the scales or writing the scene or whatever. So the books of prompts, I mean, there's like a million and a half of them under the sun, but my two preferred, they come in series. The two preferred series I have are the Brian Catelli books. One of them is called The 3 a.m. Epiphany, and then there's a follow-up called The 4 a.m. Breakthrough. And I really like his books because they're broken down based on technique. So he has character-related prompts and plot-related prompts and dialogue and this. So it kind of does the hard work for you, right? Like you need to figure out dialogue. You go and you look at the dialogue chapter in his books and boom, you've got like eight different exercises you can try. And then for writers who, instead of having only one author supplying the prompts, sort of want a variety of voices, there's a similar series edited by Sherry Ellis called Now Write, which is basically the same idea, only instead of having one person providing all of the exercises, it's like different, this one person sort of curated writing exercises from a bunch of different famous authors. So both of those, and they both are series. So like there's multiple choices in each. So you can kind of go to a bookstore and pick and choose and browse and see which one speaks to you. You just need one on your shelf. I don't think, I mean, I have like all of them because I'm, it's my job to have all of them because I need to like look through them so I can recommend. But at the end of the day, any writer really only needs one anthology and one book of exercises. And then the third book that you need is the C, the craft reference book. You need a book that when you need to figure out, like, how do I do punctuation in my dialogue, you need to be able to go to a reference and like, look that up. And most people point to books like Strunk and White and stuff, the elements of style, which is wonderful. I love Strunk and White, particularly the snark. Strunk was really snarky, man. (laughs) It's kind of awesome. But there's all this like subtext in that book, which like I find hilarious. But the problem with it is it's mostly grammatical and it doesn't deal with sort of the overarching craft elements. Like how do you craft a character? or How do you deal with the three act structure? Or what do you do with an anti-hero? And so you kind of need a book that will fill that niche. There are, again, a million and a half of them out there in the world. But I would be remiss if I did not at least mention that DIY MFA has a whole lot of craft reference stuff in the book. So that when I teach people this, I basically, most of them already have my book. So I'm like, well, you can check C off your list because you already have your craft reference. If you don't, there's several others that are also equally good, but that's the one I know most intimately because I wrote it. (laughs) That is amazing. ABC, I'm going to remember that. That's brilliant. I never knew about the, I really like that, what's called the igniter on the website. Mm -hmm. I tried that out and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I was looking at the characters and I thought, what's a prop? What do you do with a prop? I was like, oh, it's like Cluedo. I need a prop in here. (laughs) And the point of the prop really is to sort of push people outside their comfort zone because it's really easy to have a character in a situation and in a setting and to get lazy and make it very obvious what that scene will be about. The prop is what adds that extra little, like usually the prop is the weird outlier, right? Like you can think of like a bride-to-be meets a 
someone from her past in this beautiful beachside scene. And like the obvious thing would be like a bride to be meets her ex lover at this beautiful beachside scene where her wedding is going to be. That's pretty obvious. But then you throw in like a pair of red shoes (laughs) and it's like, that's going to change things. Suddenly there's something different in that scene or a secret letter or a popsicle stick. Like, I don't know, whatever, but like there's some weird thing. And the prop is usually the thing that kind of throws you off your guard. And when you're a little outside your comfort zone, that's when the best writing happens, I think. That's brilliant. I absolutely love that. (laughs) What have you seen as the trend? I don't want to, that's such a horrible word. Anyway, lack of a better word at the moment. How have you seen writing evolve, especially in the entrepreneur world, where a lot of people are writing their own books and self-publishing? How big has that boom been or has it always been there and no one's just really noticed it? Self-publishing has been around for a long time. I mean, people like Charles Dickens and people from way back in the day would self-publish. Like it's been around. But the thing is that what hasn't been around is the credibility behind it. It used to be that in back in like the 80s, 90s, it was vanity publishing. Like you paid to get published and it was taken, it was sort of looked down on. People be like, oh, you self-published. Like, so no one would take you kind of thing. (laughs) And it took a while. It really took a long time. And, you know, when Amazon, when Kindle came out in 2007, that shook things up in a major way. I mean, when Amazon came on the scene in like 1990, whatever, like 1998 or 99, like that already kind of threw people for a loop. I remember being in college and being like, what do you mean people are buying books online? (laughs) Who would ever do such a ridiculous thing? Don't you want to hold it in your hand? Little did I know that, you know, 20, 30 some odd years later, it was going to be like a whole thing. But the thing is with self-publishing is the minute it became, there've been like different layers, right? In the trends of it. Like in the beginning, people would sort of look down on it. And back in 2007, when I interned at a literary agency for about six months, because I wanted to see behind the curtain, I wanted to see how publishing worked by being in it for a while. And that's coincidentally also where I connected with my now agent, who at the time was the person I worked with. Like I was his intern and then he's now my agent. It's kind of cool. But I don't necessarily encourage people to get internships just to get an agent. It's not that it doesn't work that way, but it happened to work out nicely in in that regard for me. But what was interesting is back then, like people with self-published books, like you'd look at that and be like, like, uh uh-oh, like no one else took this book and then you published it yourself. Is it going to be any good? And even if they were really good, like there was sort of that shadow over it. And then right when Kindle Direct, like when they started doing the Kindle publishing, in the beginning, it was a little tricky. Like there was still that, like, is it vanity publishing? Is it not? And then you started seeing a few writers who started to really put their publishing pants on and like act like grownups and treat their publishing like it was a job and not just like a second fiddle, second place to getting published by a big publisher. And you saw that with like the Hugh Howies of the world and the Bella Andres who like built audiences and sold like thousands and thousands of books. And then, you know, had this whole grassroots movement behind their writing. And then all of a sudden, all of these like big publishers are trying to like coax them to come back to traditional publishing. So there've been all these like trends, right? But I think the thing that's been most important is treating publishing like it's your job. And that's the same whether you are traditionally published or self-published. The only difference is that when you're traditionally published, you relinquish a lot more control. When you're self-published, you have to delegate, but do it intelligently. A lot of self-published authors, the biggest mistake I see is people trying to do too much themselves, and they don't realize that they need to be the CEO And they need to hire out all of those different like jobs. You should not, as a writer, unless you are a phenomenal graphic designer, you should not be designing your cover, your book cover. That is not okay. And so even if you're a graphic designer, I would not design my own book cover. I would hire someone else to do it, even though I have a background in graphic design, because it's such a specific niche of design. So it's like just knowing enough about being able to delegate the different roles. When you go traditionally published, that delegation gets done for you because your editor kind of becomes the hub of that machine. 
and they delegate all the different tasks to their people on their team or they work with the publisher or whatever. And then you as the writer are just sort of the one providing the content and then kind of giving your stamp of approval at the end. And you have to sort of live in that weird no man's land of limbo where you're not quite sure if your vision's going to be preserved, but you hope it will. I was very lucky. My editors at Writer's Digest were incredibly dedicated to preserving the DIY MFA vision. So I was very involved and they gave me that privilege throughout. Not many writers get that. So I always like to sort of qualify that by like, if this is not normal, I was very lucky. That's amazing. I want to divert a little bit. Like mm-hmm. you haven't been in writing and publishing and this whole DIY MFA forever. You were a toy designer. Like, <laughs> say what? <laughs> toy designer? It's the same thing. (laughs) It is exactly the same thing. It's kind of, I know it sounds weird, but it's, I exercise the exact same pieces of my brain as a product manager at a toy company and a toy designer that as I do now as the founder of an online education company. The difference is that instead of creating these physical products and having to communicate with like manufacturers in China about like the specs for how they were going to like injection mold the pieces of this toy is now I'm talking to like, how are we going to build the interactive online classroom so that people have this experience with the course that we want them to have and like what's the content that goes into it. But it's the same sort of project management mindset or entrepreneurial mindset. And I mean, if you think about it, most project managers, whatever field they're in, they're basically entrepreneurial. They can't, they might not be entrepreneurs, they might be working for someone else, but they have to be entrepreneurial in the ability to see the opportunities and then to be able to pull all those ideas from different areas and kind of funnel them into the same product or process. So it's really like when people say, oh my God, you're a toy designer. That's so weird. I'm like, it's the same thing. Like I literally do the exact same job. It's, I find it to be more fun since I don't have to answer to a boss. That's really my big difference for me. But yeah, it's the same thing. But using different, you're using a different part of your brain. The one is more for writing the one is more design of an object and the other one's more kind of like a figment of your imagination that you're bringing to life. I mean, you're bringing both but to life. But storytelling is design and design mm. is storytelling. In my yeah. mind, the two are one and the same because at the end of the day, when you're telling a story, you're crafting an experience for your reader. And when you're creating a product, you're crafting an experience for your customer. Yeah. And depending on how high end or low end your product is. I mean, if you've ever gone and bought something at Tiffany's as a gift, everything from the way it's wrapped inside the little leather baggie that goes inside the box that then has the ribbon, like it's an experience. When you open a blue box from Mm -hmm. Tiffany's, it is very much an experience. And that's part of the brand, right? And that had to be designed. That experience had to be created. The same thing is true when you're designing a story. You're creating that beginning, middle, and end. And I have this whole theory that I believe that design, anything that is designed essentially follows the same emotional three-act structure that Mm. occurs in a story. I mean, you look at the way theme parks are designed. They actually have, most theme parks, when you walk into them, have that thoroughfare that brings you into the park. That's act one. It's sort of laying down the rules of what this world is and you're going into this new place. Which characters... Exactly. Who the cast of characters are, who you are in relation to those characters, what that experience is going to be about. And then you usually come to some pivotal landmark in the middle of the park. That's the inciting incident. That's the moment where the park opens up for you Mm -hmm. and you kind of go wherever you want to go. And like, this is true, whether you look at like Disney theme parks or even just like you walk into like shopping centers, like a lot (laughs) of time they have this thoroughfare that kind of introduces you into the space. And then there's sort of that decision point in the middle where you decide, am I going to go to Macy's or am I going to go to Sears? But it's still the same thing, right? It's an inciting incident where then the character makes a choice. You, the character experiencing the story makes a choice. And then as you explore the story, the story kind of evolves. And then when you finish the day or the experience, you're kind of going back out into yeah. like, it's usually it culminates with something exciting happening. Like in a theme park, you have fireworks or a parade in shopping. It's like, or a prop <laughs> in shopping. <laughs> <laughs> or you might, in the case of like a customer experience, you have the customer pulling out their credit card and paying for the thing that they bought. And that's the climax of the experience. But then there's always that denouement, you know, that experience of like, 
exiting. And if you look at really well done environments, like Disney World is a great example, where even the process of exiting the park kind of has a feel to it. And it sort of, it almost like weans you off of the magic that you've had in that experience. So I personally th don't think of the two things as being separate at all. I think that des designing, I mean, even the process of opening the Tiffany's box, it's like when you open it and you go, oh, <laughs> that's the climax, right? That's like the top of the three act structure. It happens in a period of like maybe five seconds, but it's still a story that's sort of tied together. So I think everything really is like the whole world is stories. What a cool outlook. I love that. I love it. I think like that as well. I've never actually put it into words. So that's pretty good. It's like, oh, that's, 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 that's my thinking. Put it into words right over there. Gabriella, just put it into words. So tell me something. What are you, or what is something you're not good at? Something I'm not good at. Oh, let's see. There are many things I'm not good at. <laughs> I am not good at dealing with mediocrity. Ooh. And that might seem like, you know, kind of people saying, oh, my biggest weakness is I don't have weaknesses or, or something like that. No, that really bites me in the booty a lot because the world is full of mediocre people, unfortunately. And that's really, really hard for me. So it's often... I've had to build filters into my world so that I don't have these knee-jerk reactions every time mediocrity like shows up in my world. And I've had to build a very amazing team of people who help to filter things that get to me that they know are going to drive me nuts and also filter my responses to those things when they do get inevitably get to me. So yeah, like dealing with mediocrity is not, and by mediocrity, I don't just mean like bad quality. I also mean like inefficiency, slow. I'm not a patient person at all. I want things yesterday or like a year ago. Amen. I think, I think most entrepreneurs are like that. The problem is that like in most, in the real world where the most people live, like patience is kind of like it's expected. And in publishing, it's incredibly like challenging because everything is, it's always like hurry up and wait. Like you have to get things in by a certain deadline and oh my god like it's a deadline it has to be there yesterday and then you wait for like a year or something and there's a lot of that in publishing and part of it has to do with like the corporate structure of a lot of these publishers a lot of it has to do with just the fact that like you need to get things to a printer in time so they can actually print the darn thing and that takes time mm -hmm. so there's all of these like moments where you're rushing and then you stop and for me that's very difficult like i'm much better at kind of having that same pace and just sort of keeping things efficiently moving along. So yeah, dealing with I, I mediocrity. Think I, I think I'm, I'm with you on that one and complacency. Trust me, I just can't deal with it. Just stop. <laughs> I would also say the other thing I'm not good at are feelings. I'm oh. not an emotional person. I have a hard time dealing with emotion. And part of it, I think, and I've been more open about this lately, part of it has to do with the fact that I have bipolar. So because of that, and it's something that I've been more open about with my listeners and my readers over the year, the last year or so, but for a long time, I often felt like if I let any emotion happen, it was just going to go, and it was going to turn into this like thing. So I had, I felt like I had to keep things clamped down. And so the allowing vulnerability has been also a big challenge for me. It's been a beautiful challenge because I feel like unlike the dealing with mediocrity where I don't feel like I will ever grow the more I deal with mediocrity, like I will not be a better person after handling mediocrity, but dealing with vulnerability actually does help me become a better human being. And so that's been sort of a positive growth area in my life. I love that. Vulnerability. Yeah, Rising Strong. I love that <laughs> book from Brene Brown. I don't know. If oh, yeah. Know, right? They're just oh, ding, ding, ding. I've read it and I've listened to the audio book. So oh, wow. Double whammy, man. So tell me, is there still something that you still wanting to achieve in this lifetime? I want to build a theme park. Oh, wow. How I know. I like took cool. me no time to like even think of that. Like, no, this is something I've wanted to do since I was a kid. And I have no idea if I'll ever do it. I don't even know if it'll be an actual park or if it'll be something else, but I want to build something that is experiential for people. I have no idea what that'll look like. I just know that I want to do it. That is so cool. <laughs> Goosebumps. <laughs> what, a, what a cool thing to think of in this lifetime. I want to build a thing park, like a huge humongous, just like happening. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it. Now, listen, we're coming to the end. Like I could really seriously talk here like forever. 
But, but you know, my editor's going to go, keep it down, keep it down. Oh, okay, okay, whatever. So I ask all my guests two questions near the end. And I'd like your input on, in filling the gaps, creativity for you is? Existing. Oh, that's a good one. Passion for you is? Existing. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, I'm not being facetious here. Wisdom for you is? I think you know the answer to that. <laughs> eh. Ding, ding, ding. Existing. <laughs> oh, that's cool. How do you want to change the world or challenge the world doing what you do? I think I already am. I mean, I think really just doing more of what I'm doing. And I think, and sort of backtracking a little bit to what you were asking about, like creativity and passion and wisdom. I mean, I think for me, the thing that really kind of hits home is that like a lot of people think aspirationally, like I'm going to become this, I'm going to become that. And yet a lot of us are already doing the thing that we want to be doing. We just don't know we're doing it yet. So a lot of people are saying like, I want to be a writer and yet they're writing in their journal secretly before bed every night and they don't think of themselves as writers. And so, and the same thing like with wisdom or passion, like they're already passionate about things. They already know a lot about things. They just don't allow them. They don't give themselves permission to be passionate or permission to have that wisdom, right? So my, if I were to have any sort of message in that regard, it's like, you're already doing it. Just own it. And I think that ties to the second question that you asked as well, that like, how do I, what do I want to do to change the world? I kind of like, my big challenge is to be stop thinking about tomorrow and just focus on now. Like I'm already doing it. So like, how can I just do more of now? It comes through a lot of education though. If you're not aware that you are, that you have it, because all you see in front of yourself is the victim mode. And Mm. you're not able to see past that. So through education and being aware of things, you're able to see past that and change things as well for yourself and know, oh, I'm actually a writer, even though I'm writing in my journal. That's pretty cool. I mean, I count myself as having written today if I wrote a grocery list. (laughs) There are some days where that is all the writing I do. And you know what? That's okay. That's reality. Mm. That's what being a writer is. It does not mean you're going to write the great American novel every single day of your life. The point is that like, you're not just writing grocery lists every single day of your life. Like at some point you will write other things, <laughs> but it's okay to give yourself permission to only to do the sort of less glamorous version of whatever it is you want to do. Yeah. Gabriella, thank you so much for being with us here today and sharing your knowledge. It's been so <laughs> awesome. It's just like, <laughs> just like, once we switch it off, I'll be like, oh, I have <laughs> Ask some more questions. It's pretty awesome. I look forward to having you on the show again sometime in the future. That would be awesome. Hopefully with a theme park on its way and design. (laughs) Well, we'll (laughs) see about that one. (laughs) DIY MFA theme park. How how awesome would that be? That would be a writer's theme park. (laughs) That would be pretty cool. cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have an awesome day further. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Dang, that was just super califragilistic expialidocious. I enjoyed having you on board and please do me and you a favor. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud or Stitcher. Click subscribe and a super bonus. Leave your review and you stand a chance of being announced and advertised on the show. I'm always striving to ensure that your brand is uplifted and empowered. Remember, done is better than perfect. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and send in your feedback too. You're the absolute best. Keep rocking.